one room. All right. So there's still some people coming in from the waiting room, but we're going to go get ahead and get started because I know we have a lot to talk about today. Um, again, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to TMR's Master Advisor Series. Today is July 21st, and this is Master Advisor episode number 55. We're going to be speaking how to handle lapsed clients today. And we have a great guest that is joining us in a second, but I want to make a, just a few announcements first. Um, I'll do my best to get these get through these as quickly as possible. The first is that speaker view is always going to be the best option to watch these hour sessions and that the chat on the bottom right is open. Um, so please drop any questions or comments in there and, and we'll do our best to get to them as we go along this afternoon. Uh, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So any relevant questions, please, please don't be shy. I'll drop them in there and then we'll grab them as we go along. Um, the next is I just want to thank everyone for coming out the past couple of sessions uh, when we spoke about selling bachelor and bachelorette trips. And then we spoke about tips for selling the Caribbean. Um, those were really new topics for us and we got a ton of positive feedback. So we're very happy about that. Um, if you're interested in rewatching them, they, they're all available on our YouTube page and we'll drop Tom, just drop the, drop the link to that in the chat. Um, and they're also available on travelmarketport.com slash training. Um, so if you want to rewatch any sessions, either the last two or any of the 50 plus we've done before, please go ahead and, and go in there and that they're all easily accessible. You can watch them on demand, uh, whenever is most, most appropriate for you. Um, so I know our schedule has been a bit irregular of late, and I just want to touch on that. Right now, we only have one more of these scheduled for the unofficial summer season. Um, that one will be with Melissa Mackey, who's a past guest, and, and she's going to be coming on to talk to us about creating Instagram Reels, which I know is, again, something new, and it's something a lot of advisors have asked for, especially the ones who are social media heavy. We're very excited about that. Um, that will be mid August and Tom just dropped the registration link in the chat if anyone wants to register for that now uh, ahead of time. After that we're going to be going back to a regular schedule every other week for the fall starting in September we've already booked a few guests for that schedule we have some really great announcements to make soon, so please just keep an eye out for that. All right. All right now that that's out of the way let's get to the topic of the day. Um, today we're going to be talking about handling lapsed clients, particularly those who haven't bit used your service in some time. I'm very, very excited to welcome Beth Flowers, the VP of Leisure Sales with Brownell Travel, to talk to us about why this is such an important topic right now. Talk to us about her experience and what travel advisors can sort of know about this thing moving forward. Um, and I want to say thank you, Beth, for joining us today, for lending us your expertise, and uh, and uh, welcome to Master Advisor. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thrilled to be here. So I, a lot to, of great so I want to get in to the topic of the day. I just want to give you sort of a chance to just to introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, give us a little bit about your background in the industry. Sure. Yeah, happy to. So um, one neat thing to just throw out there right off the bat is that I got into this business in the pit of the recession back in like 2008, 2009. So for those of you that might be new and thinking that um, a pandemic is not the best time to start a travel business, have no fear. It works out. I promise. Works out really well. So um, started way back in the recession, really built um, my business as an advisor, uh, working from the ground up. I was um, lucky enough to land at Brownell where I answered every cold call that came in and uh, really built it. From, from the bottom. Um, now, um, you know, 13, 14 years later, uh, things look much different, but in a weird way, we're all back to having a clean slate and a blank canvas to work from. So that's kind of really what I wanted to talk to um, everyone with today and have a good dialogue on. Um, it's how do we move forward with the blank canvases we've been given? Uh, yes, I was in a role here at Brownell as partner in development for quite some time um, and on our leadership team. I now have decided to go back and be a full-time advisor again. So that's been a really exciting recent transition in the last couple of days, weeks, actually. So um, all good stuff. Happy to be here. 
Yeah, and it's nice to hear that you made that move. Congratulations on that move too. Um, and I know you've experienced it in a lot of different ways. So I'm very excited to, to have you here to talk to us about Labs clients. Um, so let's go ahead and get into it right now. Um, I was hoping you could sort of just give us a definition of what you mean by a Labs client. Is it simply someone who hasn't used your services lately or is there a time period that you usually experience what you would consider a Labs client? Sure. So it's so funny. Just this morning, I was doing an inquiry with someone that I hadn't heard from in a while talking about the Galapagos. And I was having to remember like how long ago it was since I had been to the Galapagos. And these last two and a half, almost three years now, seem like such a blur to us. Really, I consider a lab client anyone that you have not worked with um, prior to these three years, right? Because the world of travel has changed so dramatically that a last client is really anyone that you did not have a trip with that needed to be pivoted or credited or canceled, whatever different genre you had the pandemic. Uh, so really anyone kind of um, four years ago and more would be lap to me if you're really, you know, freshly re-engaging with them. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And I know that definition might vary for a lot of travel agency owners or travel advisors, Correct. but it's nice. Yeah, it's nice to put it in context. Um, so we spoke about this topic a little earlier in the week, but I just wanted to ask you, why is this something that's become so important for you and your agency? Why did you think it was so relevant now that, that we, we would should have this chat about it? Yeah, exactly. Um, for me, this profession and a career as a travel advisor, there is nothing to do. And I think the amount of newcomers that we have to the business, a lot of people changed careers during the pandemic. They came in to the business and we had a lot of people saying, peace out, that's enough for me, I'm retiring. And there's this major flux going on in the, in the industry right now. And a lot of it is having to do with clients that are coming out of the woodwork that you may not have heard from and had somebody call me for a honeymoon the other day that I had not heard from in 10 years. He's now getting remarried. I did the first time. Now I got to do, you know, so it's like these people are coming out of the woodwork. And why is that important? Because that gives us a fresh, clean slate to make our businesses into what we want them to be and to help our colleagues potentially rebuild their business. Or maybe they're looking for clients that you don't necessarily want. And we share in this together. And um, that's what I love about this point in time. There's zero competition, right? The faucet's on, it's running. So um, let's share and build each other up within this industry to make it as special as we can because we deserve to be compensated really well for what we do. Yeah. And I know there's some advisors on the call who want to talk about searching for those lapsed clients. Or we're gonna, I think we're going to get to that as we go along today. But uh, sure. but yeah, but yeah. what your experience, Beth, seems to be a, a common thing a lot of advisors in the industry are hearing about is that clients are daunted by trying to travel on their own now. And so they're coming back. They're, they're sort of coming out of the woodwork, like you said, even, even if they've been gone for all, over a decade, like you mentioned. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing I wanted to talk about too, Dan, is that with this interesting point in the business where it's taking three to four times longer to plan trips because of all the new genres that we're into now. We're, now we're healthcare professionals, we're border control people, we're now lawyers with insurance. You know, we've got all these new skill sets we're working with. So it can take three times longer to plan a trip. So you've got to be so much more discerning with the types of clients we take, right? Because there are only so many hours in the day. So it's not even necessarily about lap clients as it is how to be selective with the time that you have with the clients you want to take. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer that question, but it's, it's like, you know, we've got these two forces coming at each other. You've got a lot of people, renewed interest in travel, renewed interest in working with an advisor. They want somebody held accountable and to collaborate with. And then you've got the people you've always been working with who need you now more than ever. So how do we balance that? Yeah. And I know, uh, I'm curious if anyone in the in the chat have has had the same experience as Beth with that 10 year gap between cl uh, client calls. That's just such a unique thing. I've, it seems to me it's a unique thing, but I know there's a lot of people on the call with a lot more experience than I have too. Um, but let's, so uh, we spoke about it earlier in the week. We sort of broke it down into five steps for dealing with sort of the deluge of lapsed clients. 
that is coming for a lot of travel agency owners and travel advisors now. And I want to get through all five steps in the next uh, 35 minutes or so, and then hopefully we'll grab sure. some questions along the way. We'll, uh, we'll maybe answer some other questions after, but, uh, but let's start with sort of that initial phase of, of this hat when this happens. I mean, you have a client reach out to you. You mentioned some, like not even being able to remember some details right. when dealing with a client, you might just have their name in your system, things like that. I mean, so what's exactly, what, yeah. What's that first step going to be and what should travel advisors be aware of? Right. So, you know, the first step for us is really reconnecting emotionally with the client and really kind of trying to remember what it was like to work with this client. Did we enjoy him or her? Did they respect how we work? Um, what do we have in common with them? And so you're asking all those fun emotional connections and hopefully, you know, you've got good reporting systems, a good CRM where you can remember, you know, you're seeing the ages of their kids and how much they spent with you last time, um, you know, and you kind of can connect on some emotional levels, whether it's, you know, the name game or they've moved and why they moved, how they spend the pandemic. And you're just kind of remembering and refreshing through your records um, of what it was like to work with that individual from an emotional standpoint, because we all know that uh, we got to weed out all the germs, right? No one has time to work with people they're not going to enjoy. So that's kind of step number one for us is how we're emotionally connecting with the plan. Yeah, so, so that initial call, whether you get an email and then you sort of set up a phone call or a video conference, however you want to do it. I mean, any tips for having that initial conversation to, to it's almost like you're re-qualifying a client. Um, any, any advice? Exactly. You, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one of the biggest questions kind of once you have reconnected is uh, you want to, in a kind way, fin figure out a way to say, so where are you calling now? Or where have you been for the five, six, seven, eight plus years? You know, and that's always a fun discussion to have. I'm usually pretty saying, well, you know, I know we, you know, did your trip to Thailand, you know, eight years ago. Have you been able to travel since then? And sometimes they've had major life changes or they really felt like they could do it on their own. Well, no one even wants to go to Nashville, Tennessee on their own anymore right now. I mean, you know, so you're kind of uncovering where they've been, what they've been up to. And, um, you know, which leads a little bit to step number two, which yeah. is knowing who you're, who you are as an advisor and what your specialties are, where your gifting is, what you want for your business moving forward. Because it's what you're asking, you know, what they're asking you about or what they've done in the past is a great signal of, oh, they were a great fit for me then but not necessarily now. Um, so I don't want to jump ahead to step number two. But, no, but you, let's, uh, yeah, so we, I see, like you mentioned, Beth, I know businesses change and businesses adapt, especially over the last three years, there seems to be a lot of that adaptation compressed with COVID. And we have some people in the chat who said they've experienced the same thing you've experienced that uh, Deb says it's been five, some clients are coming back after five or 10 years. Sally said the same 10 to 15. Luann said the same 10 to 15. So that seems to be a, a long, an easily a long enough time period for your business to change. So I guess what, what you're trying to get at is you have to see if they're still a fit for how your business has progressed throughout the few years. Right. And I'll just be super transparent here. I need to go back and watch your honeymoon and Caribbean um, call that you just mentioned. So back when I first started, you know, 13 years ago, and here I am just taking all the calls uh, when Brownell was a very different animal than what it is now. I don't do so many honeymoons anymore. I've really gotten to where I'm focusing on multi-gen travel. Um, I was, you know, our, our community has a lot of honeymoon planners. So if someone is wanting to engage with me on their child's honeymoon or their grandchild's honeymoon or whatever it is, I'm probably going to use my community, my resources to say we have, you know, 100 great advisors here. They've all got different specialties. Let me set you up and put that on my lead board. Or I'm going to go do the Facebook channel, you know, where people are looking for great leads for honeymoon. So we're utilizing our resources, but I do not want to take honeymoon clients right now because it's not the knowledge that I have really fresh in my brain and it's not what excites me right this minute. So 
um, knowing your North Star. That's what I call it. What do you want your business to be about? What do you want the clients to look like? How do you want it to feel when they call you? All those are such important um, aspects to go through in, in your calls and your interactions when they first come back after 10 or 15 years. I mean, their lives are going to look different and your business looks different, most likely. Yeah. So we have a we have a good comment in the chat, and I was hoping you could talk about a little bit about this, Beth. Okay. Jennifer, Jennifer says she's a single operator, home-based agency, and she says she keeps copious amount of notes in each client's file for quick reference. She says she's found it useful to put a smiley face on the on the notes on the folders for clients I enjoyed working with and an unhappy face on the folders of people I've never worked with again and I mean is that something you would recommend even because I know new clients are coming in I mean to to make to make notes of how you you've been able to build relationships and how the relationships have went with clients just so you know for when this yeah process happens I love that Jennifer amazing idea that's um so smart because the fact of the matter is we all know that if you enjoy working with the client or you did in the past, chances are their personality and how they're, who they are in their heart hasn't changed, right? But that same jackass probably is not all of a sudden a warm and welcoming, respectful guy. And his chances are his friends may not be either. So we really want to heighten our level of awareness to, um, you know, how a client respects us and respects our teams um, and how they treat us. And those smiley faces are a great way to <laughs> make sure the stamp is for, yes, I'll work with that guy again, but maybe not the next one. I got the frowny face for sure. Let that one go. We've got other leads that can take its place. I mean, so are there any other any other tips or any other uh, processes you use to, to weed clients out? I know you mentioned maybe them not fitting your specialty anymore. But is there anything else that you you yeah. have in your head that you would yeah that 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 would some be something to present to a client that would help you help you with that process? Sure. So sometimes I love to ask, um, you know, are they only flying um, business first class now? I know that you know in the past you only flew business first. Is that still kind of the way you want to go about things? Yes, I do. Yes, I want to travel in the same manner that I did in the some of them are like, gosh, the pandemic, you know, hit me particularly hard. So this trip, I really need to pair it back to X, Y, Z. And it might trigger me to think, you know what? Some of our wholesale partners would be great for this. You know, we've got an expert that works in that arena that's, you know, really good at that. Let me let you speak to my colleague. She is amazing at understanding how to get the wholesale air that you need in the economy or whatever it is and bundle it with hotels. So air is a big thing for me, understanding um, whether the same hotels that they liked previously, are we still in that genre of hotels or are they looking to take it up a notch or again, do we need to dial it back a little this time? Just kind of understanding where they are um, and whether they're, a lot of people post pandemic have built a much bigger budget for travel. They've been saving for two and a half years. They want to really blow it out this time and only do one trip versus they used to do three a year. Now they want to group it all into one Hallmark experience. Yeah. Um, that's a few little questions I asked. Um, so I see a lot of questions about reconnecting with LAPS clients. I want to get to that too. Uh, we have a few yeah. more steps I just want to work through. I promise we'll get to it. Um, but I want to ask you, Beth, about fees because I know we talked about that time during COVID, how business has changed. And I've written a lot and spoke to a lot of advisors who, who look to fees to change the way they were getting paid during the pandemic or right. since the pandemic. Right. Um, is that a way? I mean, how, how have you dealt with fees? How does fees come yeah. into this conversation with LAPS clients? Well, it, this is the biggest step is what I call resetting the playing field. You have to reset the playing field with these clients that have not you know, come to you in a four plus year or three plus year because they have to understand the amount of flexibility that's now required of travelers internationally. You've got to be flexible. It's not an easy road out there. They're all hopefully watching television and reading the press and everyone knows what's going on. It's, it's still very messy, so they need to be flexible. Um, and really, you know, with the fees on resetting the playing field, I mean, quite frankly, mine have doubled. 
Why? Because again, there's that much layers between the time that I spent before and how much elevated now my expertise is to where it was three years ago. I can help them with the QR codes. I can help them with all the COVID. We can help navigate, you know, now which countries are playing nice together and which ones aren't, the way the new air is routing, how flights come in and come out, equipment changes. So for me, resetting the playing field for clients to understand how it used to operate is not how it operates now. And here, you know, is where we are in the marketplace as far as our rates. And, you know, our reporting systems are really good for this because I can very easily see what my fee was in, let's say, you know, 2015 and what it is now and help explain that difference to the client and why it is what it is. All right. Um, so we have, again, I see the questions coming in. I do yeah. want to go back because I see a lot of comments about, like you mentioned before, Beth, when, when you find out a client doesn't fit for you and you point that business somewhere else. Um, you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of great Facebook groups for this that you can sort of share your book of business. And I'm curious, I mean, is this really, a, I know everyone talks about the collaboration in this industry because it is incredibly special, but is this a common thing you've seen amongst advisors really being able to share a book of business and to be able to push, not push clients, but maybe hand clients off to advisors they think are more appropriate for them? Yeah, I mean, yes, I can only speak from my experience here at Brownell, but we have an entire Slack channel dedicated to leads up for grabs. Um, and the way that it works best is to do what we call a warm handoff. And what that means is that usually we'll do a joint conference call with the client and the new advisor. And um, we'll get the, you know, client three-way call, if you will, conference call. It doesn't have to be Zoom all the time. You know, a conference call still work um, or a Zoom. And it's simply letting them see that we work collaboratively with one another. We all want what is best for these clients. And most of us have learned that when we step too far out of our comfort zone and our specialties or whatever, it always doesn't end well, right? So the best premise for me is to put the client, have their best interest at heart, and put them with the best person possible for the job. Um, and I am here, I mean, goodness, we have um, several agencies around us, and I have great friends at different agencies that have different strengths. Um, so I've been known to share with them too. I mean, you know, we just, there's enough business to go around. All the stats are out there. People are retiring in droves from this industry. We need new people to come into this business um, and look for a mentor. Find someone who's been doing it a long time. If you're, if you're hungry for more business, it's out there. We just have to be resourceful and, and share with one another. Yeah, you know, it is, it is nice to be in a spot, and I'm hearing this from a lot of advisors, where turning business down isn't such a foreign thing, because a few years ago that it was, everyone was so hungry for business just because of the dearth of business during the pandemic. So it is nice to be in that spot, um, and it's nice to see that collaboration. One thing I do want to ask, though, when we spoke about it, when a client's not a fit because maybe your specialty changed or you, uh, you, you, you changed the way you do business, but what if you do get a difficult client and it's not someone you want to work with anymore. I mean, in that situation, is there, is there a way to not hand them off and just to simply say, maybe this isn't, maybe you should find another advisor to work with. Exactly. Because we don't need to be passing around the jerky clients, right? If, if they're not, you know, respectful of um, the type of work we do, their chances are not going to be respectful to the next person. So the gracious no is what we call this here. We yeah. call it the of the gracious no um and usually you know we try to build them the potential client up in their own way and say well it sounds like you really might know how to do this yourself and there are plenty of resources um that you can go to to do this yourself if you feel strongly about x y and z um a lot of times i'll also say you know i'm so sorry to to tell you i'm, I'm not sure I personally know anyone that handles 
you know, this particular tiny town in middle America where I'm not adding any value. And that's another catchphrase we use um, often is, um, sounds like a great trip, sounds wonderful. I don't think I can add any value. It seems like you're wanting to work in an area where we don't have an abundance of resources and we don't really have anyone really knowledgeable about that here. Um, but best of luck, I know there are probably, you know, some groups out there that, that are associations. That's another good one, tourism boards associations and you know we'll we'll google them that's how i come out um google these associations and tourism board and send them the links you know you try to be as gracious as possible but there are clever ways to get out of that yeah all right so just to recap i know we have about 20 minutes left so i know we have maybe one and a half more steps to get to and then we're going to tackle sort of connect reconnecting yourself with labs clients uh but we went through it. Yeah. it was, the first step was re-engage emotionally with a client. Find the second mm -hmm. step was find their expectations and see if it fits your business now. And then third step, right. what we just spoke about is uh, connect with another advisor if they don't fit or if you have to fire a client, so be it. And you just sort of move on. Um, and then you spoke about a little bit about resetting the resetting the playing field. Um, yeah. Spoke, yeah. If you want to speak a little bit more about that, I mean. Fees, sure. business practices, what else is important to make sure your, cl your, yeah. your client I mean, is aware of? A lot of times, and you know, I hope I'm not exposing too much here, but um, many of these clients have not been faced with you know, the amount of waivers that we have them sign now, right? So we've got a brilliant insurance desk. They're going to get their insurance waiver as to whether they're accepting insurance or denying you know, insurance. Then we've got you know, a brilliant air desk, and are they going to have problems? us work the air or are they doing their own air okay they've got to sign off on that you know then they've got the blatant, you know the obvious one which is the covid waiver are they going to sign the covid waiver and nowadays unfortunately after the pandemic um you know we've got to think through the financial resetting of, or were they wiring money do they you know there are a lot now more steps from banks incurring money post pandemic here. so we're um constantly wanting to get excited with them and let them be excited, but also as advisors, not be liable for some of the pitfalls that weren't there prior to the pandemic as well. So um, that's part of that. That's also why our fees have escalated. But most clients, you know, because the press did such an amazing job for us. I mean, do you remember this, Dan? I mean, during the pandemic, all they were talking about is how you need a travel advisor. It was like the pendulum swung completely back. Um, you can do it all yourself to don't travel without a travel advisor. So this is our moment. Now we just have to capitalize on it and reset the playing field so they know our fees and why we're charging what we charge. You know, that's interesting because I know we've talked, spoke about those waivers on this series before, but we didn't, we never spoke about maybe clients being unaware or caught off guard that this is just a part of the process now. Um, and we, I mean, we have a comment in the chat and it's a, this is kind of tangentially relevant about uh, we have an advisor who's having difficulty getting a client to email or mail a copy of the passport. I mean, I mean, any advice for having this conversation that, hey, you need to give me this, you need to sign this, this is a part of the process now, this is this is how business works. I mean, when you do get clients who who question it when when they are reconnecting with you. Well, it's kind of funny. One tactic or strategy is to let this part be a totally separate conversation from when you are in that initial emotional moment with them. You're excited to hear from them again. You're excited to work with them again. It does match your net, you know, your North Star, your, your specialty, or things you're excited about, different themes. I like to let clients rest in that for a little while. Let them rest in that, send them some sample itineraries, send them this. And then when you do that second call to say, are you excited? Did you like kind of some of the ideas that I had? Then that's when I find it's best to go, okay, well, let's talk through how this is going to look different from the way it did in 2019 or 2018. We've got a couple of steps that we're going to need to go through this time that weren't here the last time. And some of it is to protect me now as an advisor, but mostly it's to protect you as the traveler. 
Um, and then you just got, you have all your list and your resources, you know, things that you need to go through to check those boxes and make sure that, you know, they're fine with all the incoming DocuSigns and electronic stuff headed their way that they need to sign off on. I mean, it's crazy. I did a, um, one of my first big yacht charters since I've been back in a, in a full-time advising capacity this week. And I was shocked at the amount of waivers that the owner of the boat, the charter, you know, they were having the client sign in addition. So that was another aha moment for me. It's not just about the advisor. A lot of times it's the operator you're working with has also shifted their business practices. That's part of the conversation too. Yeah. I didn't think, again, I'm seeing some more comments about this in the, in the chat. I didn't think this would be such a common problem about having difficulty securing these kind of waivers. And we have someone, we, I think Jennifer mentioned about an employee and I see who is having difficulty filling out her own waivers. I mean, I mean, do you have a process or a protocol when dealing with a client specifically um, about, I mean, is there a point in the process where you say, I need these waivers and then we'll move along? I mean, or is it, or is it sort of depending on how you're talking to each client? Certainly for anyone that has not been in the fold of your business in a while, I would be very cautious of moving forward without any of the waivers. Of course, every independent contractor is entitled to run their business how they think fit. Um, you know, if the guy that lives down the street from me hasn't yet turned in his insurance waiver, but I've worked with him for many, many, many years on multiple trips, am I going to give him a week longer and still proceed with job? Probably. But um, I think our, our caution level has to be really high with these lapsed clients. The further back you go, the more cautious you need to be, you know, because it's just, um, you know, you want to protect yourself, really. We've all, we've been here two and a half years. There's no reason to add on any more risk than you have to. Yeah. Uh, and there are clients out there that want the experience desperate enough that they are going to abide by your your rules, so to say, um, and trust you. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have one more step to get to. We have about 20 minutes or so left, and we're going to talk about, I see questions coming in about lapse clients again. I don't want to get to that. We have a question about DocuSign. I assume that's sort of what, what you might use, Beth, but there's a lot of CRMs and a lot of different uh, apps and companies that, that perform that kind of digital signature uh, process. Um, but let's talk about the fifth step. Uh, you mentioned the other day it was re-engage emotionally again with the client. I guess it's just, just about re-qualifying the client. It's about starting a booking uh, with, with these lapsed clients. Yeah, exactly. And you, you're really getting the commitment. So, right. So we talked about how like we're kind of in that second phase. You've sent them, you've let, you've sat them with their dreaming for a little while and you sent them things to dream with. And then they've come back and they say, yes, I've talked to my family or I've talked to my, you know, group of girlfriends, whatever it is, we're in, we can't wait. And then you're going through kind of all these prerequisites that they may not have experienced before. Now it's time to kind of get that commitment. And, um, you know, we do that through a process where we have them sign off on our, you know, new fees and it's a very kind of thorough process with the DocuSign or Bright Signature or whatever your platform you're using. Um, and by then they've heard it, they're well aware, you've managed their expectations. And so then you can get back to that exciting part again. But I do feel like that commitment, I'm not going to spend any more time at that point. That that stopped. I've, I've sent you the dreaming material. You really were excited about it. Are you still excited about it? Okay, so to then move forward, here's what I'm going to need to have back from you. Uh, that's kind of my fifth and last step. And then once you have that commitment back and you've got a credit card that's ready to charge those fees, you're off to the races. All right. All right. So uh, we have some time left, which is great because I, I saw a lot of questions in the chat that we're going to circle back to. I see Patty asking about DocuSign. And if any other of the advisors on the call have alternative uh programs they use for electronic signatures, I, I would love to hear it in the chat. Um, but, but Beth, we've had a bunch of questions about sort of the other side of this, which is not yeah. having clients reach out to you, but going searching for those clients who maybe stopped, yeah. stopped reaching out to you. And I want to talk about right. that a little bit, because um, that's, that's sort of an extra step in the beginning. I mean, what, what, uh, what kind of advice do you have for clients who 
had a book of business pre pandemic for one reason or another fell out of favor or not fell out of favor, but fell out of touch. Um, yeah, and they, they just want to yeah, they wanna rekindle yet. those relationships. Yeah. So going, um, I have two things that I was thinking about. The first is, um, you know, you've got most of you anyway, I'm sure, um, have great reporting systems, right? So you want to go back to your reports, you know, three plus years ago or for whatever you deem appropriate and look for the clients that have the smiley faces. I think it was Jennifer that had mentioned yeah. that system you know i rank mine by productivity okay so you can see the revenue that they generated nine times out of ten you can refresh when you look down um their reservations on who it was the types of trips they did um and the the key has been snail mail snail mail is back um, write them a letter and say hey, you know, things are really looking up. I mean, we are really seeing that 2023 is getting tight. I haven't heard from you. I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, just wishing you well. Hope you've been, hope you and your family are well. Stick your business card in there or something. Um, so I think reporting is really key to going back and looking at who you appreciated working for and then um, see what they're up to. Um, you know, in some cases, as we're traveling ourselves, uh, using social media, of course, can be great. And maybe they're commenting on people are commenting on your pictures or doing a heart or whatever. You can easily then go to their page and message them and say, hey, I saw, you know, yes, I'm here in Croatia. And it's awesome. How have you been? What are you up to? Let's try to reconnect. So, you know, there, those have kind of been good little tactics for me i still i'm only back in this particular seat a short time but god the first thing i did was like print everything off and be like where are those gold mine fabulous smiley face clients i'm gonna write them a letter and let them know i'm i'm back to doing design work again so yeah and i know like i mean cool. we spoke about these clients that are reaching out to you and i'm sure there's a lot of clients who want to reach out to you but maybe don't have the personality or don't have the the guts it takes to sort of reconnect with someone they used to use like it's you know so i guess reaching out yourself might help, yeah might help propel those conversations yeah i mean truth be told everyone is so super busy with yeah. you know whatever it is going in on their lives and a lot of times they just need a starting point so one of the best starting points that we have is that when something cool comes across your screen, maybe it's a new hotel opening, maybe it's a new ship that's, you know, about to debut, or it's a fantastic new itinerary that reminds you of somebody you used to work with, you know, supporting that and just saying, hey, I'm thinking about you, we haven't caught up in a long time, you know, everything is really great again, great, you know, whatever you want to say to make it feel positive. Um, and just ask if there's a good time you can catch up. And I saw that, you know, the Portrait Milano is opening up and you love Milan. That was one of our last trips we did together. It made me think of you. People just want to be thought of. They want, pro, you know, everybody wants to be loved. You know, all those songs, they're true. Just go back to the ones you love, make them feel loved. It works. Yeah, I know. So we, we have a ton of great comments in the chat. Um, we have people who write, do we, a, a big common theme seems to be personal notes. We have Jennifer, I think is doing handwritten notes on trip anniversaries, things like that. Uh, it seems oh, the, common, the common theme seems to be get as personal as, as possible yeah. or as comfortable as you feel getting personal with these clients to, to try to reconnect. I mean, I know, I know there's, a, there's a lot of email marketing lists that make it easy to sort of shoot out a a a single sort of impersonal message but it seems like getting personal is the best point of view to have when you're when you're trying to reconnect with clients i think so especially if it's been a, a long period of time you know um and and do your homework i will say <laughs> i'll tell you i ran a foul um someone i was trying to reach out to you know i didn't realize the couple's not together anymore you know you, you kind of so using the google using facebook using skin yeah. whatever you have just before you go there make sure it's kosher you know there's yeah. some pictures 
together, you know, all those sorts of things. You don't want to step, do a little bit of homework, especially if you're reaching way back into time. But, um, you know, a lot of people know their clients pretty well. They yeah, that is, a, that is a great point. I didn't think about that because you, you, do, do, you do want that initial uh, introduction. And again, we mentioned getting personal, but you could, things could have changed in their lives, just like it changed with your business. So do a little bit of homework. Yeah. Doing, I, think. Yeah. I mean, well, like the, you know, I did the guy first time in here it is 10 years later. Now he's calling me for the second honeymoon. Well, I didn't, know, yeah. you know, I, I didn't kept up with him, you know, whatever. Yeah. He's just yeah. being careful. It is amazing how great of a tool Facebook is for travel advisors. I mean, we talk about social media a lot. Again, we're going to be talking about Instagram next month, but Facebook just, just seems so powerful for so many travel advisors and travel agency owners uh, to be able to keep up with clients, to communicate with clients, and to do a little homework when you're dealing with I clients. I agree. And I think that that was accelerated by the pandemic because so many of us needed to be with our people and our peers. And this industry is so niche that, I mean, my husband can't even relate to me. He's, I've been married to him 21 years. He doesn't <laughs> think of it. I need to be with my people. And Facebook and the pandemic provided that level of comfort, really, of, of we're in this together. And now, as these two pillars come together of it takes longer to do our jobs per trip, and we've got people that maybe want to re-engage with us for quite some time, it's a great lending spot, I think. Um, you know, if you don't have a great community built within your agency, which I highly recommend, obviously, then that's the next best thing to me. Build a community of um, mentors and friends and people that have diverse businesses so that we can share in resources. Yeah, so I see we have, I'm trying to just make sure we tackle all the questions in the chat. We have a little less than 10 minutes left. So if you do have a new question, please drop them in there. Uh, I have a couple of final closing questions I want to get to. Um, I'm glad we got the, we got, we, there's a lot of suggestions for DocuSign in the chat too, which is interesting because I've never heard a lot of these companies. So it's, it's nice for me to know as well. Let me just make sure it looks like we, hopefully we've answered all questions. Um, Jennifer has another one and she gave us the great smiley face tip. So hopefully, I mean, if this is something you can answer Beth, but she wants to know if there's any tips on removing people from your mailing lists, whether it's email, or I think she answered about direct mail earlier. Um, is that do you have a philosophy when it comes to this client no longer belongs to this community? Yes, I had to do this actually um, recently and really pair back. Um, and for me, again, it came to making a decision, at least in the short term, of what I'm looking for in clients, and then everyone else just needs to be compartmentalized on the side for a while, um, maybe not proactively marketed to. But if you if you know what you're about and what we want our business to be about, then knowing the names that go with that should be easy to decipher or easier. It's never easy. Um, and then it's a click of the uh, undo the marketing, right? Check and then it undoes itself or at least in our system it does. but um anyway yeah i know i know a lot of advisors have philosophies when it's a certain period of time and then they get removed i i mean i think uh uh it, the question jennifer asks about direct mailing which is going to be diff more difficult because you can't see the opens you can't see the click-throughs but uh mm. but i think it's just it, it it depends on the sort of the feel so we have one we have another question in the chat beth and this is a very very tough one i can tell already but it is relevant. Um, Lynn asks, how would you approach a former client who has been traveling, but is you can see she's been tra he or she's been traveling, but she's no longer using you or your agency. I mean, is that something that you've experienced before and you've made a decision on one way or another? Sure. I mean, let's be candid. There are always those great clients that um, you thought you were a great fit, but maybe they had other ideas and you see them off gallivanting around. Um, you know, to re-engage with them, I've had one where I reached out in a personal way. Um, I did do it via email because I didn't feel like, you know, catching people on the phone like that can be really um, not a high, you know, you want to be smart with your EQ on this. So I did it via email and I just put, I think she was in Hawaii and I put Hawaii in the subject line and I just wrote a simple two line and said, your trip to Hawaii looks so amazing. Do you have any tips for me? Um, I'm trying to get there in the next 18 months. I'd love to hear about it when you have a minute. 
And, uh, you know, this lady was gracious enough to call and say, wow, it's great to hear from you. You know, yes, we had a great time. It turns out my husband had an incentive trip or what are those called where your company, like, you know, they went, hit a sales level, so they took him to Hawaii. Well, she, you know, so, aha, you know, sometimes we're (laughs) taking things maybe more personally than we should, or, you know, she could have easily said, you know, it was a great trip, thanks, be sure you go eat at whatever, you know, and left it at that, but she didn't. Um, She gave me a reason why she had gone, so that was kind of nice. I mean, I, I think just as long as we try to have a genuine reason for wanting to engage with these people. You know, why are you engaging? Are you really wanting to genuinely connect with them or are you trying to get at the root of who the competition is? You know, those are two very different things. I'm not great at either one, but. um, Yeah, I know. I saw the question. I knew it. I know it's a tough task for advisors, especially we talked about Facebook and I guess there's a negative side that comes with that too, because you can see clients who are traveling yeah. maybe and not use your services. Uh, so I guess it's, it's a delicate thing. You can do your best to engage with them, not in a sales way, but like you mentioned, Beth, in, in a personal way to see uh, to see if they're interested in speaking. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I want to sort of end on a note that you talk, spoke about the other day uh, is that you spoke about and you mentioned it a little early, earlier in the call about elevating the profession as a travel advisor. And I want to give you sort of a second to sound off on that. Uh, what do you mean by elevate the profession? And like, what do you think has to happen for this community to continue to thrive, even when this sort of travel demand rebound eventually does come back to normal? Yeah, and, um, you know, I'll predicate this with, with saying, um, email me if I, if I rub anybody the wrong way, just let me know. But it was shocking to me when I got into this business 13 years ago, that, um, you know, it, a lot of people, a lot of advisors had not come around to charging fees yet. And I couldn't understand that because I was paying an interior decorator an ungodly amount per hour, and no one was waking her up at 3 a.m. in the morning with canceled flights. And no one was having visa issues, um, you know, that came up on the fly at the last minute for a work trip and you know no she was not in these very um kind of bucket list experiences of life's biggest moments okay so we work in the space of people's biggest life moments their weddings their baby moons maybe it's after a divorce maybe it's after a death maybe it is they are celebrating their you know fifth grandchild and taking the whole family to a villa. I mean, we normally are working in some big life moments and that comes with a lot of pressure, stress, knowing your expertise. And this is all stuff pre-pandemic and look what we know now. And it just dawned on me. It's like, wow, you know, architects, CPAs, interior decorators, you name it. These people are charging incredible amounts for their services, and we have the same amount of responsibility to our clients as those professions, if not more. So shouldn't we be matching the compensation levels that many of those different service industries have? And um, so that's my real soapbox, so don't get me started because I'll go on and on. Well, again, that I know it's a great uh, opinion. I know it's a great take to have. We've had a lot of people on this who who share that opinion, Beth. So you're definitely not uh, not a single person, not not a not a single unique opinion. I mean, this is a thing that's a lot of advisors talk about. We've had other people too talk about why they don't charge fees. Um, so I know yeah. I know uh, I know a lot of people feel very strongly about fees, but it is great to hear well, your opinion. And- you know, I will be perfectly candid. There are um, a handful of clients that I um, continue to work on some key accounts and still will to this day that, um, you know, they've been straight up with me that they, you know, appreciate, you know, paying the air desk and other types of things, but that they know that these are huge trips and they would appreciate me not nickel and diming them with you know, fees, and I've had to make the call to either keep that business or let it go. Um, 
some of it I have kept without the fee because the trips are that big. And um, it's okay because I, in my mind, can justify the time compensation ratio and it still works. And as long as that ratio works, okay, just know what your hourly rate is. That's my thing. Okay. Know what your value and your value is super high. Yeah, so I see a lot of people in the chat agreeing with you. Uh, it might be another time, it might be a time to do another uh, session on fees and maybe I'll put that in the schedule, hopefully for later 2022. Yeah. Uh, but Beth, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I know, again, you great. mentioned how incredibly busy things are. Thanks, thank you for your time. Thanks everyone for attending today. Um, again, please join us next month. We're going to talk about Instagram Reels. It's going to be sort of a how-to hands-on session. I hope hope everyone can join us for that again. If you want to rewatch this session, it's on our YouTube or on our training page. Um, otherwise, I hope everyone has a great week. Everyone who's in the sort of the heat right now stays cool, and everyone else just stays healthy. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you all very soon. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.